talking about uh, what Ephesians would tell us about unity. Let's first of all read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. We'll start with Tim and go to Sandy and then cross to Bill, but we'll probably do that after. Um, we'll start with Tim. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling, of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Mm. Mm. Oh, I didn't get verse 3, uh, which, which is a problem. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 uh, reads uh, Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, Paul here in this chapter, he begins the chapter, of course, he's been talking about the body of Christ and the unity of the body all the way through. And then we get to chapter 4 and he talks about living in a worthy manner. How would we be living in a manner worthy of the calling which we have been called? How, how would we do that? According to verses 2 and 3. With humility. Alright, with humility. And gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's how we walk in a manner worthy of the calling. 
Christians should not, should not be constantly bickering with one another. It's one thing, people say, well, uh, we're, we're to stand for the truth, and we are. We are to stand for the truth. But that does not mean that we should, uh, that our eyes should just be on everyone else's business when it doesn't affect our own. Some people look for problems where there are no problems. Or they try to find problems when none appear on the surface. That's not what Christians should be doing. Christians should be desiring to be one with one another. It does not mean that when error does pop up that we don't deal with it. We do need to deal with error. But let's not go looking for trouble. Let's, let's try to be at peace with one another. Because that's what Christ wants. I can't be at peace with someone who doesn't agree with what the Word of God says. I can't come along and say, well, you say one thing and I say another. We can all just agree that everything is okay. Now, that's not what we're talking about. But in a congregation, in a congregation, sometimes you can walk into a congregation and say, they're just not united. They can't agree on anything. They talk behind you to get to you sorry, each other's backs, they're, they're not united in anything. Well, that's not how Christ called us. Christ called us to be unified, to be peaceful with one another, where at all possible. That's where sometimes when liberty comes in, when we actually do have liberty, when there is no, when, there, when we have a choice between two right things, how we shouldn't be causing division over two right things. Christian attitude is, all right, I'm going to give way. Uh, if, if something is right, and it's if we're given a choice between two things that are right, we should not insist at the cost of division that we get our way. And that happens, and that's hard to do. But we are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. We should look like Christians. We should act like Christians. And I'm afraid some people today who claim to be Christians don't act this way. They act in every way. If you were reading their comments on Facebook, you would have no idea if you didn't know them that they were a Christian. They may not use foul language, uh, or uh, they might not be uh, cursing God's name out, but just the way they talk. If I didn't know you better, I wouldn't have said you were a Christian. Because uh, you, you're not acting like it. And so, we are to preserve the unity of the Spirit. To preserve the unity of the Spirit, we must be humble. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, we'll do 5 to 8. Uh, we'll do Bill, Tammy, and then Naomi. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Who made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How did Christ, before Christ came to this earth, what was his, how would we describe him? And all the glory, all the glory of deity. Yeah, he was God. He had all the glories of heaven. He had all, like as far as he's all powerful, all knowing. Say, would you say that be pretty important if we if we were to compare that to a person here on this earth, the most important person on this earth, we would think, oh, was well, there's nothing better than that. There was nothing better. Now, did Christ have to come to this earth? Yeah, there, there's, there's, it depends. I know you can answer this both ways. You say, well, yes, he did. Otherwise, God's plan would be. Yeah. Well, pretend for a second that God didn't have this plan. Did Christ have to come? No, God could have cast us out. 
God didn't have to have a plan. We sinned. We deserve death. God could have just destroyed us. Uh, this idea that God had to send Jesus. Well, no, he chose to send Jesus. He had this plan. He chose to send Jesus, and Jesus, being united with the Father, agreed to come. It was all within God's power. It is not something we are entitled to because we are God's creation. We sinned. Sin was our problem, not God's. And yet God had a plan to save us anyway. And Jesus, all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all the glories of heaven, what did he do? He gave it up. He humbled himself. He didn't stop being God. We must be careful we don't take that too far, but he stopped being God. But he gave up the glories of heaven. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for our sins. And he was God. And he is God. Are we anywhere in close in comparison to that? No. Not anywhere close. If Jesus, God in heaven, could be humble enough to come to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, certainly it is well within us to humble ourselves as well to do what God has required of us. So to preserve the unity of the Spirit, we must be humble. Arrogance gets in the way. Pride gets in the way. Oftentimes when there's division, it's arrogance and pride that go to the heart of it that someone has to be right no matter what. And they may be wrong, but they think they're right. And they dig in their heels and... Pride gets in the way. Happens, Bill. I just thought that forgiveness goes with your first thought. I thought when you think about Jesus humbling himself, like when we're, somebody wrongs us, we're to forgive them because God forgave us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God is the perfect picture of everything. We say God, God didn't have to do any of this, and yet we find it so impossible. Uh, to, to do that ourselves. And the fact of the matter is that the reason why some people have such a hard time with forgiveness and humility is because they don't believe in God to begin with. And so they don't have that pattern and example. Christians should be following the pattern and example of Christ. We don't have, like the world doesn't have an excuse on us saying that, but they're not follow, they're not pretending to follow. Some Christians are pretending to be Christians lack of a better word, because they do not follow the pattern that's found in the scriptures when it comes to humility and forgiveness and other things. To walk, also we should be walking gentle, patient, showing tolerance for one another in love. Titus chapter 3, we move to Naomi and then Tim. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning from once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. I mean that such a person is wrapped and seen for his self condemnation. You know, he is warped. He's a piece of wood. A piece of wood. It's warped. It's bent out of shape. Warped. Uh, sometimes that's used as a, a personality. Like I said, his, his personality is bent. His, his ways are bent, and being warped is not something that's good. Uh, it, it has to do with sin. We are to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions. By this, we are to avoid things we cannot answer. Sometimes we have to approach scriptures to say, I do not know. We know what God said, but we don't know why God said it. Or, perhaps God hasn't revealed it to us something. And, or we don't quite understand something because he hasn't revealed it to us fully. And people can argue over what I call silly things. Uh, 
people can argue what would have happened had Jesus sinned. And we can spend entire sermons and classes on what would happen if Jesus sinned. Why is that a foolish question? First of all, he didn't. He didn't sin. That's the thing. Jesus isn't coming again to live another life to, per to pay another price for sin. It might be an interesting question to people, but it's it, 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 spending time focusing on that when there are so much more other important things in Scripture to study, considering it was a hypothetical that didn't happen. And th there, there's, there's things like that when it comes to... Um, when, when it comes to things like that, the things that we just cannot know. Where did the devil come from? People want to spend a lot of time. Where did the devil come from? And they scour the scriptures coming up with, taking, taking scriptures out of context to try to come up with an origin story for the devil. The fact of the matter is, the only thing I know about the devil is he is created because he's not God, and he will be punished. He is our tempter today. He is seeking to draw us into sin, but he will be punished by God. Do I need to know anything more about the devil? No. I need to know he exists. I need to know what he does. I need to be warned to avoid him. But in the end, he's not going to win. And so, uh, having an origin story for the devil, not that important. People here would fight over genealogies. They would quarrel about the law. Of course, the law of Moses didn't, wasn't enforced. But even when it comes to today, people can quarrel about everything and anything. Does the Word of God say it, or does it not? If the Word of God says it, we should be able to open to a passage and read it. If the Word of God doesn't say it, it means I can't open to a passage. What happens if the Word of God doesn't say something? What have we studied in this series about that? Well, it be silent. It's not binding, for one thing. Yeah. In the silence of scriptures, we have to we have to be able to understand where where liberty and liberty and silence are not the same thing. People come along and say, well, the Bible's silent, therefore God accepts it. That's not true. That is just not true. God, if God has given us liberty, that means it's right. God has never given us liberty to sin. And so if we have liberty to do something, that means I should be able to go and find a principle in Scripture that say, this is right. But the Scriptures do tell us, if something is not of faith, if I can't do it knowing it's right, should I do it? No. Now, people say, well, you don't know it's right, or you don't know that it's wrong. And my response is, you don't know it's right. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Anything God wants me to do, he's told me, is good. Absolute. Marriage. Good. Man and wife. That's a good thing. Children are good. Uh, having children. The church and everything that goes with the church, that's good. All things that pertain to righteousness are found in the scriptures. We always want to test the boundaries. See how far we can get. How close can we get to sin without having to sin? That should be the wrong, that's our wrong attitude. We want to say, how far can I get away from sin? Not, not create things that the law, that the word of God doesn't create. That's not what I'm saying. But we should not be wanting to see how close we can get to sin without sin. That's the wrong attitude. But if the Bible doesn't say something, we don't have authority to speak on God's behalf. Catholics, as we're going to study in a few weeks, believe they have the authority to speak on God's behalf. And we don't. They don't. We don't. God has not spoken. We should not speak. We can't say something is right, or we can't say, but we can't say, we can't say something is wrong, but we can't say it's right either. It's just simply not authorized. And if it's not authorized, we should not do it. Because we want to stay within the boundaries that God has given us. And so, getting back to tolerance, showing 
a tolerance with someone else, uh, we have to recognize that not everyone is at the same stage of their faith as we are. Some people are very new Christians. We cannot think that they have the knowledge and experience that we have if we've been a Christian for 20 or 30 years. Doesn't mean that if we see them doing something wrong that we should that we should just let that go. But it means that we should have a tolerance that will bring us to in love pointing that out and not the same way we would as if someone was a Christian for 40 years knew better and did something that was doubt not right sinful that there's as I said in the lesson a couple weeks ago there's a way of saying things and it depends on who we're talking to and if you never build a relationship with anyone who's in the church you never know which way you should handle something I can know who I can joke with, I know who I can't. I know who I need, if, 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 uh, if I need to talk to someone, I know uh, I'm learning how, what types of words I have to use to get through to them. Uh, I may not always succeed at that, but uh, it's a learning process of getting to know people. We have to show tolerance for one another. Some people are at different stages in faith. Some people have a different knowledge, some people have a different background, uh, whether it's a cultural background or even a religious background. And so putting, uh, guiding those people to the truth is not always uh, just so simple. And so that shows uh, uh, unit, unity, that's how we build unity. And let's go then to 2 Peter chapter 1, where to Sandy, we'll read one slide each, verses 5 to 11. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self control, and self control with steadfastness, and steadfastness. Uh, no. And godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if, this, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or untruthful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance, entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, another way to preserve the unity of the Spirit is to be diligent. Effort. People often say, good marriage requires effort. Well, being united requires effort, too. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen on autopilot. We have to work at it. We have to add these qualities that 2 Peter chapter 1 says. We need to add, because if we add those things, Peter says we'll never fall. Why? All qualities that God builds godly character. Faith and virtue and knowledge and patience and self-control and brotherly kindness and love. All of those are attributes of God. If we live in those things, we won't fall. When we fall, we slip and not do those things. And whatever it is we've fallen. And that, that's what happens with sin comes. Sin doesn't come to someone who is, at the moment, very strong in these characters. I'm not saying that even a person who is strong will never fall because there's temptation and we do. 
But if we're practicing these, we're not going to give in to temptation. And there might be times when we're strong and we don't give in to temptation. We didn't fall. And there might be times when we do fall. And we had a momentary lapse in these characteristics of God. And that's why we fell. We gave in to temptation. So the result of unity is a bond of peace. Brethren, preserving the unity of the Spirit, have a bond of peace. We are peaceful with one another. We get along with one another. We aren't, we aren't arguing and, and, do, and we aren't divisive with one another. A congregation that has no peace is not unified. It's just not unified. Because that's the result. And so, well, what I'd like to spend the last 15 minutes or so looking at is what this unity of the Spirit is. We talk about having unity with the Spirit. Well, let's read what that unity is. And we'll start with Tim. We'll read Ephesians 4, 4-6. to There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord all right, there are seven things here in which there are only one of. We have one body, and the body in Ephesians is described as the church. You can get that in Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 5. The one body is the church. Anyone who is not a unified member of the Lord's body is not saved. Bill, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23-24. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. All right, so the husband, or the, sorry, Christ is the head of the church. Now, does that mean I, if I am not part of Christ's body, is he my head? No. He's, it doesn't change the fact that he's the head of the body. Yeah. But he's not my head. Because I'm not part of his body. Bill's, Bill's body is not governed by my head. Bill's body is governed by his head. And so is everyone else's body. If we are not a member of Christ's church, we're not part of his body. And we read elsewhere in scripture that only members of his body will be saved. And so that should give us pause. Are we a part of Christ's body? And the only way we become part of Christ's body is by doing what the New Testament says. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so we have one body. We are united in the spirit. We have one body. We are members of the one church. There also talks about one Holy Spirit. One Spirit. All Christians are baptized into the body by the one Spirit. Bill and Tammy is next. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. In one spirit. Now this is talking about, spirit is capitalized here. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit has done what for us? Well, he's revealed to us the plan of salvation. He has revealed to us the plan of salvation. That's what this verse is talking about. In one spirit. You believe the one spirit which caused you to be baptized into the one body. One Holy Spirit didn't give a message to one group of people and they were baptized into a body, and another Holy Spirit come along and teach someone else something different and they were baptized into a body. No, there's one Holy Spirit. He speaks the same thing. They, the people who heard that message believed it and were baptized 
into the one body. That's one Holy Spirit. If we are if we are united together in the Spirit, we recognize there's one Holy Spirit, not many, giving different messages. It's one hope of eternal life. Naomi Titus 2.13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. There is one hope. It is the hope of heaven. It is the hope of eternal life. There's not one hope for some group of people, another hope for another group of people, another hope for another group of people. One hope. It's eternal life. Which brings us to one Lord. Tim, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, or either he will have the one and love the other. Hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In the context, Jesus is trying to teach about riches in heaven and riches on earth and how we can't, can't serve two masters. Well, that, that applies to Lord, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ as well. There is one Lord Jesus Christ. Why is there one? Because we can't have two masters. One Savior. We can't, we just simply, we, we don't serve two masters. We cannot serve two masters. We'll love one more than the other. We'll hate one and not love, and, 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 and not love. No, there's one Savior. One Jesus Christ who came down to this earth to die for our sins, we are to serve him. There's one faith based on the Bible. Uh, Sandy, Romans 10, 17. Okay, and then Bill Cross to Jude verse 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. All right, we have one faith. This is where there's a problem today. People might think, well, there's one church, even though they might think, well, there's many denominations. They might say, well, there's one Holy Spirit. We believe in one Holy Spirit. Well, there's only one hope of eternal life. Maybe one more Jesus Christ. But then we come to this one faith business. What do you mean? That I have to believe the exact same thing you have to believe. There's only one of that. We don't get to choose our own doctrines. That's a problem. There's only one faith. The Holy Spirit only baptized us into one body. Well, there was only one message that people believed concerning Jesus and concerning his church. If we are members of the faith and continuously for the faith that we heard through the Holy Spirit, the word of God, then we all better speak the same thing. I don't get the right to my beliefs, and you're the right to your beliefs. You don't get the right to come along and say, well, I can be saved without baptism, and Bill comes along and says, no, you have to be baptized. One's right, one's wrong. One's from the Bible, one's not. One faith. If we're going to be united, we have to be united in that one faith. And there's one baptism. Uh, we're coming across the Tammy Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So, if we weren't baptized into Christ, what? We haven't put on Christ. We haven't put on Christ. And uh, was, uh, there, was, there was a person who's still trying to talk to me. I haven't decided whether I'm going to respond to him yet. Again, because we aren't agreeing on something. He doesn't believe who else. Well, where does it say about water in there? Where does it say about water? It just says baptized into Christ. And of course, he believes that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which of course is not under consideration in this chapter. But Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Uh, Naomi. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Does the, did the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we read up in Acts 2 and Acts 10, 
have this symbolism of water washing. You recall? No. What was the picture that we got there? Well, there's profound things happening. Well, yes, but I mean, as far as the physical, it was described in a certain way. Loud noise. The, in, in Acts chapter 2, the tongues as of fire sitting on people's heads. There's a loud noise, a rushing wind. Those aren't terms of washing. Ananias told Paul, get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Water is the only thing that we wash ourselves with physically. This isn't a physical washing. As far as baptism, yes, is physically getting wet. But water is what washes away physical things. This is baptism in water. Baptism in the scriptures, unless otherwise, unless it is otherwise, the context specifically says otherwise, is always about water. Baptism, the, the baptism of John, wasn't a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was baptism in water. Ethiopian eunuch, see here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? All of this is water. There is one baptism, immersion into Christ for the remission of sins. Why is it that we put such an emphasis on baptism? Well, it has nothing to do with the fact that we believe that baptism alone saves people. The denominations put no emphasis on baptism. Why is it that we, 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 we uh, teach, well, if you were baptized because you thought you were saved already, you should be baptized again. People will say, well, I thought I was baptized. But you weren't baptized for the right reasons. People in Acts 19 were baptized, but they were baptized in the baptism of John. It wasn't the right baptism. Just because someone calls it the baptism of Jesus doesn't make it so. A person must believe and have repented of their sins and must confess Jesus Christ and, be, and recognize that it's for the remission of sins. Why are, you don't have to understand absolutely everything, but you do need to understand, why am I doing this? If you don't understand why you're doing it, you're not ready to be baptized yet. Because otherwise you are just getting wet. And baptism alone can't save anybody. And so there is one baptism. And then finally there is one God and Father of all. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. Uh, who's next? Oh well, Tim. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with his practices. I have put on the new self, which is being revealed in knowledge of the image of this creator. The one body came from a single unified source, God the Father. That's the, the mind of the creator. When we talk about the mind of the creator, God the Father. That's where we came from. And we are renewed with the knowledge after the image of its creator which is God the Father. So if we are in the unity of the Spirit, if we are united in the Spirit, we are going to recognize about the one body, the one Holy Spirit, the one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father. If we aren't united, we won't believe in those things. We will be teaching something different, and we won't be part of that one body. Anything else? I was just thinking about your thoughts on baptism and mm -hmm. trying to deal with people that don't believe it. It's, you know, we just have to understand it. It represents being buried in the water. Mm -hmm. It represents the washing away of our sins. It, it, it represents burying our old selves. We want to be new. We, we want to put that old man aside, mm -hmm. you know. And it's at the point that we actually are. Yeah. It's not a, a, the, the people who believe don't believe in baptisms necessary for salvation. 
they're not going to necessarily agree disagree that baptism represents washing or represents or represents burial. They won't necessarily to say that. They're just saying that just shows other people that you already had that. It's like what I was talking with the guy on the internet when it comes to James chapter 2. It's always oh, just for other people. All of these works that you do, that's for other people. God knows our hearts. He's already saved us at the point of faith. That's not what James 2 is talking about. James 2, can faith save him? From what? What are we saved from? We can't be saved from mankind. God's the one that saves us. We're saved from sin. We're saved from hell. We're saved from eternal damnation. Faith without works is dead. The demons believe and they tremble, but they're not saved because they have not obeyed. Well, likewise when it comes to baptism. Baptism represents washing and burial and, and putting off the new man. That's the point when we do that. Who's doing the work? Is it us or God? Oh, it's God. And I was challenged with a verse, and I'd forgotten this verse, and I wish I would have had it. But uh, it's Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. God is the one who is working when we are baptized. In as, like as far as even if you were to take a look at the literal act, does the person being baptized do anything? No, they're being pushed down into the water. They're being picked up out of the water. All they're doing is just being there. Now their faith is working, but their physical body is not. God is working in that he is cutting away the sin. Holy Spirit is working. He is renewing our mind and regenerating us. Everyone is working, except for the person being baptized. The person being baptized is in faith, trusting in God <laughs> to do what God has said he would do. Do we see the forgiveness of sins? Not physically. No, we don't see it. How do I know that my sins were forgiven? Yes, that's exactly right. By faith. Jesus said, when he was healing the person, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you, or rise, take up your bed, and walk? And the answer was, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven you. Because that requires no seeing on anyone's part. Only It's harder to say take up your bed and walk, because if you say it and it doesn't happen, everyone's going to know you're a fraud. Well, how do I know my sins are forgiven? The only way I can know is by trusting in the promises of God. Having faith in the promises of God. Seeing what God has done in the past to fulfill his promises and trusting and being fully persuaded that he is able to keep that which we've committed unto him against that day. That's how we walk. Baptism is the point we show that we are trusting in God to do the things that God has said. God has said, be baptized for the remission of sins. We say we believe that, and so we go do that. If we don't do that, we are not believing in God. We are not trusting in Him to do the things that He said He would, because He's not going to do the things that He said He would apart from His Word. I'm not ashamed